we have Ron Palmer. Um, he's got quite a resume here that I could rattle off, but in short, he's a Saskatchewan farm boy and he was a tinker from the start. He it sounds like he's had a few run-ins with his own ingenuity, almost blew himself up, run himself over a few times, and uh, he was one of the pioneers in the auto steer industry. So he's, he's an electronics wizard, um, and he's a very smart man. And uh, without further ado, I'll give you Ron Palmer about natural grain dry, natural aeration grain drying. Okay, thank you. I've never been at a four screen conference before. Two, yes, but you know, one is my sort of usual one, and two, you can sort of play around with a pointer, but four, that would be a real act. So I decided to go with the mouse here. I don't usually like getting tied behind a podium, but I guess I will. And what I would like to start off with is a giving a little plug for my colleague Guy Lafont, who passed away this spring. He's the guy that actually started this whole experiment uh, that I'm talking about today. And uh, it's really sad. He was, he was really the key guy in Indian Head, and he ran all kinds of projects and was really a, a neat guy. And I, we had lots of discussions and academic headbanging that went on, uh, even with this project. And just a little story about this. I was teaching at the University of Regina, and I had access to grad students. And Guy was collecting this data for quite a while, and he kept all his, these files in a brown envelope. And I was out there visiting one day, and he was really proud of how he had set this experiment up, and he had these sampling tubes and everything. And then he pulled out this brown envelope, and he says, well, maybe I can find a grad student to go through this data for me, because he says, I don't really have time. So I took this brown envelope, and it sat on my desk for a long time, and I was kind of looking for grad students. But you know, usually grad students aren't really all that great at plowing through data, and we're engineers, we, we like building stuff, not plowing through data, neither do I. And so I, I eventually gave this brown envelope back to Guy, and so I couldn't find a grad student to do it. Well, time went on, and in 2011 I took a sabbatical. I was actually looking at doing something quite different with, with inter-row seating, trying to get the shank between the stubble rows, and I was collecting some data, and it was a November, cold November day, and it had snowed the night before, and I couldn't go out and do any more experiments because it snowed. So I was sitting in the office, and he comes tranching in with his brown down the envelope again. <laughs> and so, uh, well, now how am I going to get out of this? So I started arguing with Guy. I said, uh, well, Guy, I, I don't really know what you want to do with this. Uh, you got a bunch of numbers here, temperatures and relative humidities and stuff. I don't know. Like, what I guess we, I, I, I really didn't want to do it. But I wasn't, wasn't doing much else. So I started. So the first question I asked, Guy, Guy, where are we going with this? You know, sort of like uh, Ken was talking about precision farm. What the hell are we doing with this? Where, where, where do we, what do we want to end up with this? Uh, what's the objective? If we're going to build a controller, uh, for a fan, or is, is that the objective? Well, I don't know, you know, he's just sort of mushroom. I said, well, I'm not starting anything until we have a clear objective. And so we did, we hammered an, an objective out. And uh, the first thing that comes up to mind, well, let's only turn the fan on if, if drying is occurring, or plenty of drying is occurring. Sort of seemed like the obvious one. But actually, now I started thinking about that. Why are we do actually doing this? We're actually doing this to keep safe grain. We want our grain secure. That's our income as farmers. And that's the most important thing that we have going, is to keep that safe. Well, what are the factors in keeping safe grain? There's actually two things. Cool grain, and we forget about that little cousin there, that little partner. He's actually a huge partner. And it's going to turn out a pretty major one. But we always talk about dry grain. Oh, we got to get the dry grain. Well, actually, if you get the cool grain, it doesn't, you, don't, you don't have to worry about drying it that fast. And the beauty about cooling grain is you can do it quick. You can't always dry it that quick, but you can cool it quick in a matter of hours. So the first strategy that came up was only run the fan when the ambient air conditions will result in the drying of the grain. But I've modified that. I've changed that objective and I've, I'm slipping towards only run the fan to make the grain as cold as possible. Mm, that doesn't sound like it's going to work, does it? But well, we're going to see. 
So first thing, that, and this is out of lots of literature that shows what are the safe storage days? What is safe grain? If you have grain that's hot, I don't have much room here to walk, work this mouse, but I will. Okay, if we have grain that's really hot, this is at 30 degrees. Let's suppose we have grain that's at 15% moisture, wheat or barley or something like that. It's a little tough. We don't really have, well, we have quite a few days. But if we have really tough grain, 18, 19%, we're talking hours before we can get into a really bad situation. That thing could really start cooking on us. Now, the colder that we make it, and let's just stay on this 15% mark here, we have more, like say, it almost doubles, we're up to, to a month. And once we get down to room temperature at 20, we're up to 100, and by then we're, we're into late fall already, at Christmas, it'll cool down by itself and we're safe. So there's two things that we gotta keep in mind when we're talking about safe grain, safe, secure grain, cool and dry. The worst thing is wet and hot. We're just asking for trouble. Now the other thing that we have to keep in mind is what's going on here with this drying? What's actually happening? There's actually a battle going on, a continuous battle between that grain kernel that's trying to push its water out into the air, and the air has got water in it too, and it's trying to push water back into the grain. And the two are fighting it out, they're duking it out. And this is called vapor pressure. How much force or how much is it actually pushing against to get one getting the advantage over the other one. Now it turns out that temperature from the, the temperature of the grain is the dominant factor in determining how hard it's pushing that water out. And likewise, it's the temperature of the air that's trying to push back into the kernel, that's also the dominant factor. Now, if you're going to use vapor pressure as a controller, and some people are, there's a number of companies that are trying to do this, uh, but it doesn't work out that well. In fact, it doesn't work at all. Because we can measure the vapor pressure of the air fairly easily, but to get the vapor pressure of the grain is difficult. And we do it through a process called equilibrium moisture content and sort of backwards try to get it. But it's difficult because, number one, it's not the same for every kernel. It's not a homogeneous body that's in there. And to put a little sensor on each of those kernels, or, I mean, that's ridiculous. So this, it's a very difficult problem to try to use vapor pressure itself as a controller to see if it's bigger or less than the actual vapor pressure of the air that's coming in. So that didn't work. So the next thing I thought of was, well, let's forget about that. I, I know there's lots of garbage that's going on in that bin inside. Let's just treat it as a system. This is an old engineering trick. Let's treat it as a black box. Let's just look at what's going in and what's coming out. I don't really care what's happening on, you know, as individual little kernels what's happening. I care about the whole thing. Are we drying or are we wetting as, as, in terms of the whole bin? If there's more water coming out than going in, we must be drying. If there's more water going in than coming out, we must be wetting. When the water must be going into the grain, into the black box. So, for a real simple example, let's suppose we are putting in, uh, what, what do we have here? One hour we measured 80 pounds of water going into the bin and there's 90 pounds of water coming out. Duh, there's 10 pounds of water that is coming out of the grain. It's got to be coming out of there someplace, so it must be coming out of the grain. So the question is, how do we measure the water going in and how do we measure the water coming out? So we use something called, and just lucky, that we're measuring the right things, we use something called a psychrometric chart. And this is where I dis disagreed with, put it up here. This is where I disagreed with Ken when, when he was talking about humidity. There's a huge difference between humidity and relative humidity. Humidity is the actual amount of water that's in the air. Relative humidity is something else, as we're going to see. So the first thing that we're going to look at on, with the psychrometric chart is the saturation line. And it depends, it tells us how much water that the air could hold, the maximum amount of water that, the, uh, in this case I'm using 6,000 cubic feet. Um, and all I have to know is the temperature. If you tell me the temperature, I can tell you how much the maximum water that that air can hold. In this case, 80 degrees, 9.5 pounds. For 60, it's 
five pounds. For 40, and it's going down pretty fast, 2.5 pounds. And for one, one pound at, at 20, and it just goes down. I, I, actually, I've got to excuse myself here because I'm, I'm changing between Fahrenheit and Celsius, but we're becoming a bilingual Clark crowd here, I think. But so I'm, I'm going to mix up, and it's just the way I made these slides, and some of them I made the charts with, with pounds, and some of them I made with kilograms, some with Celsius, some with Fahrenheit. It doesn't matter. It's, it's the, the principle still holds. Now, compare that to a really warm day, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, we can hold a maximum of 12.84 pounds. It's a huge difference, 12.84 pounds to one pound when it's close to freezing. The water holding capacity now depends also on the relative humidity. The relative humidity is just a prorated amount from the saturation line. So all I have to do, come here, mouse. All I have to do is, is look at the saturation line and go down by that prorated amount. So 50% is just 50% of the saturated amount. And likewise, 25% relative humidity means it's the 25% of the saturated amount that that's, gives me the actual humidity or the amount of water that that air can hold. If you, t if you ask me what the relative humidity is, and, and what I can do with it, nothing. Relative humidity by itself doesn't mean anything. I need to know the relative humidity and the temperature to tell you really how humid the air is. If you say, oh, the air is 35% uh, relative humidity, doesn't mean one damn thing. You have to tell me the temperature because it's 35% of the saturated amount at that temperature that gives me how much water's in the air. Now, that might not seem like a big deal, but people back, they slosh it back, and that's why I sort of got pissed off with Ken when he <laughs> messed up there. But I, I, I apologize. I, I, I didn't mean to come down too hard on you. H2O, okay, so let's, here's an example. This sounds like almost an academic question. Air entering the bin is at 60 degrees Fahrenheit, 55% relative humidity. And it's leaving the bin at 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 45% relative humidity. Well, I look at these two relative humidities and I say, well, geez, look at that relative humidity going into the bin. It's 55% and it comes out at 45%. Must be drying, right? Or what? Or wetting? No, went in wet. Look at this. Went in really wet. 55% came out dry. 45% must be, oh, I don't know, like, I don't know what's going on here. So what you have to do is you have to take both the temperature and the relative humidity, get the humidity for both of these before I can actually answer this question, are we drying? And if we do, we can actually calculate by not just are we drying, but by how much. So here we go. Here's the temperature going in, 60 degrees. We prorate it down by 55%, and we can actually see that we have a little over two pounds of water per 6,000 cubic feet going in, and we have, on the output side, we prorate that by the relative humidity. You know, so we take our saturated amount, prorate it by the relative humidity, go across, and we actually are taking out 4.27 pounds. So we're actually taking out a fair chunk of water. Even though the relative humidity is less going in than coming out. Did I say that right? Whatever. So now, the, the first thinking that we had was, gee, we could build a controller then. We could actually, you know, watch and see if the water is coming out, and we could actually build a controller. And now, let's say uh, we are measuring 3,000 CFM. I can actually even calculate how many pounds of water per hour I'm actually drying or wetting. Cool. So that's what we did. We, we instrumented these bins. This was done, back done in 2007. Temperature and humidity of the air in and out, the airflow with the pitot tube, uh, temperature of the grain, we had sampling ports put in, etc. This slide didn't work, so I'll just skip it. Air tubes for recording the CFM coming in here. It's just a pitot tube, just like on an airplane. It measures the static pressure, etc. And we have, this is looking up into the sky. This is the relative humidity and temperature probe that's catching the air that's exhausting the bin. Interesting for me, not so much for you, but okay. 
So we put the sensor here in the roof and we put the other relative and temperature sensor for the air coming in. It was just tucked in underneath the bin and it obviously caught the same temperature and relative humidity of the, as the air going into the fan. And then this was all stored. And then really the neat part about the storage with this system is that it was stored on an hour. All this data was stored every hour, but it was also time tagged with a date, time, right down to the second. So I could look back and actually look at the weather or look at whatever event was going on that day or get the time of day and, and actually start to take a look at things, which proved very useful. So he took that. It was, all came on a, now here's the interesting stuff that came out. And I just about crapped my drawers when I first saw these plots coming out. This was almost two years ago, in November, late November. And I started plotting this out. And we can see that this is the actual water that's being removed, OK? This is the subtraction of the, of the water going in minus, or the water coming out minus the water coming in. And we can see that the first hour, there is a huge amount of water coming out. And so 170 pounds per hour. You know, I can't even carry, I can't even bench press that. So here we go, and we go down, 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 every hour that we go along, and then something really magic happens. We start pumping water back into the bin. And then we take water back out, and we pump it back in, and then we take it out, and then we push it back in, and then we take it out, and then we push it back in, and then we take it out. What the hell are we doing here? <laughs> You know, we would have been better off just shutting the bloody fan off right here. And actually, we would have. But no, we like to run our fans, so we, we run our fans. Now, the other interesting thing is, when do you think it flipped from taking water out to pumping water back in? It turns out that this is, turns out, it's almost uncanny. This is 9 o'clock in the morning. 9 o'clock in the morning, it flips from drying to wetting down. And all during the day, it wets the grain down. And we see this after run after run after run. Well, it's not 9 o'clock, at 9.30 in Newfoundland. <laughs> you know, usually that joke doesn't go over very well, but you guys are awake. Okay, so here's another run. This is uh, 2009, or I'm sorry, this was in, I forget what year what this was. Uh, but this is another run, and you can see this again, this diurnal cycle. And that's another word I learned. I thought this was the thing in boys' bathroom or something. And I found out, no, that means daily cycle. Oh, okay. And I, you can actually accumulate these, this amount of water per hour and look at how much we accumulate over a certain period. And this, in this case, it was 1198. Uh, and then we pumped 334 pounds back in. And then we took out 367 pounds. And then there was a couple, look at this. This here we actually went through a, a whole day. We went through this night and night. And then we went through a day where we actually didn't put water back in. Cool. We, we, we ducked that bullet, eh? And so we can actually measure exact amounts here. So this is pretty neat. This is the first time that I believe, I don't know if anybody else has done this, we got a really nice window using this to watch hour by hour what's happening in that bin on a field scale basis, not a lab basis. On a field scale, watching those daily cycles actually happen. So that first day, we lowered the moisture content of that grain 1.8%. That first day is critical. Man, can we take water out of that bin that first day? By 9 a.m. Again, it switched at 9. That's first night, not first day. Isn't it? Well, actually, we started in the afternoon. So, yeah, it's not, it's not a complete day. So it was that this first day, we were actually taking water out over the night. And then at 9 o'clock, at 9 o'clock the next morning, it flipped. And then it flipped here again. Here's another 9 o'clock. Now, here's a 9 o'clock where we actually went right through. So switch, switching at 9 o'clock, if we turned the fan on, only, if we only switched it, turned the fan on during these three periods in here, we would have been done. We would have had the moisture content down to 14.2%. Isn't, isn't this just the damnedest thing? And for years, since 1967 or whatever, what have been people telling you? Turn that fan on continuous. 
You know, nobody's ever seen this. It's, 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 I, I just, I just said, wow. Yeah, I just couldn't believe this myself. This is just crazy. We've just been, we've just been wasting our time, just spinning our wheels. In fact, we've been doing damage. We're, we're pumping water back into the bin. Air wetness. Okay, back to Ken's, sorry Ken for picking on you here, but air wetness. How does that correlate? I started playing around with this. How do, how do these different things correlate with this diurnal cycle of the water going in and out of the bin? So this is actually a measure of the, not the relative humidity, but the actual humidity of the air. How much water is in the air? And look at the correlation here. Here we have really wet air, and we have water being pumped into the bin. And when do you think this is occurring? When do we have the wettest air? One o'clock in the afternoon. It's typical. I mean, it varies, obviously. But it, and when do we have the driest air? When is this the lowest? Well, I came up after plowing through the data with roughly 6.30 in the morning, early in the morning. Well, how can that be? There's dew on the grass. That's the, that seems when it's the wettest. You know why that seems that? Because the air has dropped all its water onto the grass. There's no water actually in the air because it's all on the grass. It's dew. It can't hold it. It's too cold. So that's the dry air. And look at how that correlates that dry air with the drying of the grain. In fact, you know, you could make a, a controller that just uses that dryness as it put a threshold someplace and only turn the fan on if the air is that dry. Well, you'd, you'd be not too far off. What are other things that line up? What about the outside air temperature? This is an interesting one. For those of you that think, oh, I should turn that fan on when it's nice and hot, oh man, because you need the heat, to, you know, you need that heat to, to get that grain dry. So what I'll do is I'll turn my fan on here and just wet my, wet my bin right down. And not only that, it'll make it hot, too. <laughs> That's just great. You know, why, why does it do this? And you say, well, gee, that doesn't seem to make much sense. You know, take a cold day like today. For those of you that wear glasses, you'll, you'll understand, you'll relate to this. You're outside. Pretend your glasses are the grain. And the inside in here is the nice, hot summer day. You come inside, your glasses fog up. Why? Because that hot, moist air gets close to your glasses and it cools down and it says, I can't hold this water. I'm going to dump it on your glasses. And that's exactly what happens with the grain. That hot, moist air from the day hits that cooler grain, dumps its water. Can't hold it. Ends up on your grain. Very strong correlation. And then we come across to a day cold. 50, it only went to 15 degrees. Oh, geez, there's no point in running the fan today. It's too damn cold. And look at what happens. This is when it dried. Isn't that the damnedest thing, eh? Just, we were just doing exactly the opposite. Another hot day comes along. Put a pile of water back in. Dry day, skip through another day here when it's nice and cool. I don't know, this is pretty hard to take, isn't it? So, on a really cold day, when the temperature goes down, that's when we get good. Now, here's the next thing that's really interesting. Let's compare this to the grain temperature. And I used the mid sensor that was right in the core of, of the grain. Every time that there's cooling, that this temperature is going down, we get drying. Every damn time. Every time this temperature of the grain is going down, and if you go back to that glass scenario, you can understand what's happening. As long as the grain is warmer, or, or that we're cooling, that must mean that the outside air is colder to be drawing the air temperature down. So that cold air is hitting that warmer grain, but as soon as that air hits that warmer grain, it heats up, and it has the ability to actually dry the grain. So every time we pull this down, and the faster and harder we pull it down, the more drying we get. Every bloody time. So therefore, we draw the conclusion, drying when the grain temperature is decreasing, cooling is drying. 
Cooling is drying. And in fact, I'll even tell you about how much. If you cool your grain by 15 degrees Celsius, you'll be drawing out about 1% of the moisture content. Cool, eh? Not only am I telling you that it's doing this, but I'm telling you by how much. I went through all that data all the way back to 2007, and this is pretty close, 15 degrees Celsius for every degree. So if you, if you for example, if you cooled your grain, it was 30 degrees Celsius, and it went down to zero degrees Celsius, that's 30 degrees that you've sucked it down, you would have probably taken out about, rule of thumb, it's not exact, about 2% of your moisture. So if you put your grain in there at 16% moisture content, and you pull the temperature down from 30 to zero, your grain's going to be dry. And it doesn't matter about how big your fan was, or how big your bin is, or anything like that. Very simple, very straightforward. Hmm. Really quiet crowd. <laughs> Heating the grain is just the opposite. But it's not, that's, that's actually not as clear. Heating the grain actually does not quite the same nice strong correlation. Sometimes you can heat the grain and you can actually have a little bit of drying going on. But whenever you're cooling, almost guaranteed, not absolutely guaranteed, but almost guaranteed that you will be drying. So a good control strategy is, if I want to cool a grain, that must mean that the outside air temperature from, that's going into the fan must be colder than the grain itself, if I expect to cool it, right? It's only logical. And that's the algorithm that we ended up with. Now, so what it means is I would draw this down until I stop cooling, and then I, I stop the fan, and wait till I get a colder day, and then suck her down some more, and just keep sucking that, get it down as cold as you possibly can. Every time I pull it down, I'll be drying it a little bit. Now, I did this for all the runs that we did previous to this year, and I compiled all the statistics. Another interesting thing here, just, just one note about this. Here's the average temperature of the top, the bottom. You know, where are we here? Here's the top is 15 degrees, and the bottom is seven, almost 17 degrees. Why is the bottom always warmer than the top? Anybody know? And this is why... This is exactly why the bottom of your bin always over dries and the top of your bin is always the last one to dry. It's always the wettest. Because of the compression of the fan. When you compress air, we were pushing about seven inches of water with our fans. And it's going to be similar with, with your other aeration fans. When you compress air, you heat it. There's a thermodynamic formula that's, you know, and I calculated too, it's really close. So we get about a two degrees difference in temperature between the top and the bottom. Well, that two degrees means I've got hotter air. I produced hotter air without adding any moisture. And we know from that psychrometric chart that it can hold more water. In fact, it's not saying I can't hold more water. It says I want to hold more water. And it sucks it from the grain. So therefore, the bottom dries faster than the top. So what do people tell you to do if, you, if your top is over dry? Use a bigger fan. Use a bigger fan. More compression then we'll even get a bigger difference between the top and the bottom. Actually, you're better off with a smaller fan that produces less pressure difference. In your, I mean, you'll get a less temperature difference between the top and the bottom, and therefore, the less discrepancy between the drying on the top and the bottom. Contrary to what people have been telling you. So what we've learned so far. The black box approach has been a beautiful instrument in measuring the drying and wetting that goes on daily with, with the uh, grain. There's definitely a daily cycle that you can easily identify. Wedding never occurred at night. Through all the data that we had, wedding never occurred at night. Damn this thing, eh? You would have thought it would be just the opposite. Wedding always occurred during the daytime. Drying occurs at night and occasionally during the day if the, if the day is, is uh, cooler and drier, but cooler. Cooling the grain dries by about 15 degrees uh, for every percent that you take out. So you draw it, draw it down 15 degrees Celsius. Rule of thumb, you'll be taking out 1% moisture. Also contrary to what some, some of the things you've been told, well, you can either decide to cool your grain or else to dry it. But you can't do both. Well, I'm sorry, the two are related. You can't separate the two. 
This has lowered the moisture content from, oh, the very first day is the most critical. Easily take out 1% that first day till 9 o'clock, 9.30 Newfoundland, the next day. A cold air, even freezing air, can dry grain. Lots of people are saying, oh, no, no, no. Frozen air can't dry? I'm going to show you an example, a very recent example that shows you just this is not true. Uh, not a drying front. There's not a drying front that goes through, but it's actually a gradient that's caused by the compression. A simple effect of control would be if the turn the fan on, if the outside air temperature is less than the grain temperature. Nice and simple. And I have the naysayers that say, no, it can't be that simple. It's got to be more complicated than that. It's got to be way more complicated. Not, not, not according to our data. The data shows you pull it down, and the only way you pull it down is if the air temperature is less than the grain temperature. Could use smaller fans, possibly. Just a suggestion, more work there have to, we'll have to do. Uh, following this control, and it's, you know really what we're doing? is We're working with Mother Nature. We're using that daily cycle as a slingshot to really get the job done. Now here's interesting uh, trials that we did this year. And I haven't run all of them, but I did do bins 9 and 10. That, these are the original bins that we had. We had another four bins that I have to analyze yet, which I haven't got around to. But this was started on August the 29th, 10 a.m., bins 9 and 10. 2,000 bushel barley bins uh, with barley wind. And I told the guys, I said, geez, let's really push it this year. Let's get, you know, really wet grain. They came back, come on, I didn't want porridge. 24.5% and 25.4%. So you're pretty close, around 25%. It was mushy. Like, it was not, it was not, I, well, no, I, well, they said, well, you know, we can't, nail it that accurate. We, so I went, well, okay, let's go with it. They didn't start it till the next day. It was already starting to heat. 43.5 degrees Celsius, 43.25 in the two bins. This is, you know, this is maybe a little risky, okay? <laughs> Control strategy. Bin 9 on continuous, right beside it. Bin 10 with the new control strategy. Air temperature, it's on only if the air temperature is less than the grain temperature. Well, you can see it doesn't take much to turn it on first because it's 43. No, okay, it's going to go on. We used five horsepower flam and fans, uh, 30, running at about 3,400 CFM, seven inches of water pressure. I have to say flam and fans because he's my uncle. And they're produced right up the road here, Noble. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. So here's nine, okay? We'll start off with, now first of all, let's look at, we get our classic daily, you know, in and out, uh, here we actually went for quite a while, and then we put water back in, and then we, we had a pretty nice run here, we took quite a bit of water out, and then we stuck some back in. Ooh, look at this, look at that. Ooh, we just made it juicy again. And then in and out, in and out, in and out, all the way through. And the same thing with the temperatures banging around all over the place, up and down all over the place. But you can even he you see here, even though this is, I could have blown this up and would have showed it a little more clearly, but when the temperature goes down, water's coming out. Right here, we actually turned the fan off for some reason, like for maintenance or something, for a couple of days. And then up and down, up and down, all the way through. And then eventually it ended up colder, and then we shut it off. Uh, or is, no, I think it is shut off, yeah. We ran the fans for 1,200 hours. It would have cost us $533 in power bills at 10 cents a kilowatt hour, which is probably close to what it is here. Uh, we removed a lot of water, tons of water. We removed 5,000 kilograms or 11,000 pounds of water. So this sort of shows that if you leave your fan on continuously, it does work. It, it eventually does take the water out. I'm not saying that it doesn't work. It's just a question of what works better. Uh, and we were certainly running the fan here at times when we probably shouldn't have been. We removed 7.83%. So we're, we're, you know, we're doing a decent job of getting that water back down. And you know, nobody in their right mind should start off at 25%. But OK, you know, even if you started off at 19%, this shows that this can get the job done. The first 48 hours are really critical. Look at this, just amazing. This looked like a steam kettle when we first started it up. There was water dripping out of the sample tubes. 
Water was just flying out of there. The moisture content, the first 48 hours, 2.2%. Grain temperature lowered from 48.5 to 14.1, and that works out to 15 degrees for every percent moisture that you take out. Pretty close to a rule of thumb. The final grain temperature was 3 degrees Celsius, just a little bit above freezing. Okay, now here's the real good. This is bin 10. This is the one that we were shutting on and off. This is cool. Now, well, let's see what happens here. First of all, notice that there's never any negative water. There's never water that's pushed back into the bin. We start at zero, and there's actually there were a couple of little flicks that I did see, but they were insignificant. You could might as well say there was no water pushed back into the bin. But why? Because we didn't run the we did not run the fan when the time was right to push water back into the bin. And as a consequence, we only ran the fan 251 hours. And what was the other one? 1,200 hours? 251 hours? Hmm, what's the better buy here? $93 or almost $600? We only ran the fan a fifth of the time. We never put water back in. That's, that's a pretty good deal right there. We removed 3690, uh, 8130, not quite as much as the continuous, but not bad. Like, the other one, we removed 7-something. Here, we removed 5.4%. First 24 hours, again, that first day, critical, almost 1,000 kilograms of water removed. That first day is critical. Get that temperature down and get the water out. Lowered by 1.4%. Grain temperature is lowered 43.2 to 20.5. We got it down to room temperature. And that worked out too, just to show you that that rule of thumb does work, 16 degrees Celsius per percent. Fan stopped at 9.30. Must have been in Newfoundland. The warming, no fan. Okay, now what is interesting here is when the fan got shut off, the grain actually started warming up. Look at this. You know? Okay, here's your, here's your temperature over here on the scale here. And the, 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 the grain, we shut it off here, and the grain starts to warm up. It starts to warm up as soon as we shut the fan off. Another interesting thing is as soon as we turn the fan on, there's a blip here. You know where that comes from? That comes from the compression. As soon as we turn the fan on, it goes up a couple of degrees. And you also get a little bit of a heat from the motor itself. It's not 100% efficient, so you get a little bit of heat from that as well. But that, that goes to show you that this is all just as we predicted. So this warming turns, I, I'll even tell you how much. It takes 40 hours to raise the temperature one degree. Almost two, let's say two days per degree. Oh, that's so slow. Well, what's, what's the rush? Who's in a big hurry? You know, and then we pull it back down again, let it warm up a little bit, and we'll pull it back down, take a little more water out, and we can calculate how much water we take out, warm up, take it out, warm up, take it out. Just, and it, so it goes for a few hours some night, some nights it doesn't go at all. There'll be three, four, five nights here that doesn't go at all. It's waiting for that cold night. Now here's the real kicker. Last November, Two weeks ago, on the 22nd, temperature in Indian Head went down to 28 degrees Celsius. Sort of like a day to day, but even colder. The grain temperature went from minus 20.5. It was already frozen. 20.5? That's frozen, right? That's, that's pretty cold. And we sucked her down to 24.5 degrees Celsius. And we removed 80.5 kilograms of water. Where are those people that say that you can't dry frozen grain? 80.5 kilograms in one night. Three minutes, he says. I got a story for you, but anyway. <laughs> Final grain temperatures, minus 24.5 degrees Celsius. The good, the bad, and the ugly. I've only got two more slides, okay? So just, just hang on. The ugly, do nothing. Okay, this is not a good situation. I know you're busy in the harvest, and okay, yeah, I'll get to it sometime. That first day is critical. You gotta get that temperature down right away before it starts cooking. Even if you use a smaller fan, but you've gotta get that fan on there the first day. 
the bad. On during the days, off at night. Not good advice. Hot, wet grain is not a good situation. Don't recommend this at all. Okay, this does work if you turn your fans on continue. This was the advice that we were given for years and years. This also works. I'm not saying it doesn't work. It just doesn't work as well maybe as something else. It's not that great because we keep pumping water back in and we also are keep elevating the temperature back up and we're asking for problems with spoilage. Good, only on at night. This is what we first said, only turn it on at night. The yard light rule, on at night you are bright, on during the day you will pay. And turn it off at, at 9 a.m. And even if it's on continuous, you know, if you insist that you still want to run your fan continuous, shut it off, when you do finally shut it off, shut it off at 9 o'clock the next, in the morning. Not, not, don't wait till the day passes and turn it off in the evening. Turn it off when it's cold, at the very least. Um, better, only turn it on on the cold nights. Wait for those cold, clear nights and turn it on and wait for the weather forecast. You already know what the grain temperature is. Turn it on for that night. The best, though, is if you have a controller, and we already have this little electronic controller. You know, one of the problems is this is so damn cheap and simple that nobody really wants to get into it. You know, $20 worth of electronics. That's all they need to do is measure the air temperature and the grain temperature and turn the fan on. What the hell's in that? I don't want to get into that. <laughs> Strategy. Keep the grain as cold as possible. And it will result in the least fan time and the safest storage. In fact, I will challenge anybody to come up with a better control strategy that keeps your grain safer. And by safer, I mean cold and dry and more efficient with the least fan time. I, I will put that challenge out there right now. And not just say that it's going to work. Let's see it work. So the best strategy is turn the fan on immediately upon filling the grain bin. Turn it, on, turn it off at 9 a.m. if you don't have a controller, if you're doing this manually. That's the other nice part about this. You can do this manually. You don't, have to, you don't need a fancy controller. Keep the grain as cold as possible. Change our way of thinking. Get that grain as cold as possible. And follow the simple rule. The outside temperature is less than the grain temperature, turn the fan on. Or change our mindset. Just think of yourself, let's get that temperature down as cold as possible. That's where it'll be the safest as possible. And you'll also be drying it. And that's all for today, folks. I, I don't know, do I have time for questions? Question. You had your grain at twenty percent for the last uh, example. Yes. Moisture. Yes. So how much was the savings to sixteen percent, like the first example? Savings. You had two different. Uh, I had a control that brought the bin nine. We went. We took out seven percent of the moisture, and in bin ten, the control one, we took out five point something percent. Yeah. So what's the question? That's the comparison. And we ran the fan a fifth of the time. So it may, to get to, the, to that other, it may cost us another, I don't know, what? Maybe, maybe we'll have to run the fan a third of the time, not a fifth of the time, to get down to the 16%. I'm not sure. Does the air temperature, when you leave the fan off, Yes, actually, the, the question is, if you turn the fan off, does the air in the bin rise anyway? It doesn't rise by itself. Actually, what you get is, is a reverse circulation. That air is so cold in there now, that compared to the outside air, that it actually is falling down and going back out through your fan. So you've got that warmer air coming in on the top, and if the sun is shining, you get in the, all that roof air temperature, and it's, it's trickling down through your grain and actually warming it up. That's where we're getting our one degree rise per every couple days. Even with the fans off? E, e, well, yeah, even with the fans off. And that's, you're not going to get that, though, unless the grain is cold. Uh, if the grain is the same temperature as the outside air temperature, the two will just sit there. But since that air is so much colder and heavier, it's actually going to fall down and, and create a reverse convection current. Any other questions? Yes? So on 
this example with the two uh, bins, um, when, when you had the chart showing how much moisture was removed or added, you were just doing that on a calculated basis of humidity, relative humidity and temperature? I was calculating, yeah, you have to go through, it's a, it's a third order equation, that, that saturation curve, and you actually have to go through, the, take the temperature, and the relative humidity that we're me measuring and calculate the moisture that was in 6,000 cubic feet and then qualify that with the CFM to, to calculate how many pounds or kilograms of water we were pushing in or taking out. Okay, yep. so as a simple farmer, I probably would have put scales on one bin or both bins and then you could measure exactly what was it, happening. That's, that is another way. I think it would be more expensive, but that is another okay. way. Uh, okay. And then the other question, so what does this do to the theory of putting a heater in your inline dryer to uh, uh, inline put it, aeration put, And the, not only a heater, but when would you put the heater in? I don't think you have to, but if you're in a real rush, you should put the heater in front. And, but it would be the same rule. You should only turn the fan on when you're, when you're using the uh, dry, cold air. So then you would only run the fan at night, but you'd also run the heat? At the same time, the obviously. Same time. Okay. Okay. And I, actually, I've got a question for you too, but I get to stand up here and talk to you, I guess. But um, if we're like down here, we're farming the desert, except for the last few years, and we're combining canola that's so dry you can't even register on the moisture tester, and it's 40 degrees Celsius going into the bin. So can we use this to condition it? to a little bit higher moisture so we're not selling popcorn fart dry canola to the grain companies? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you, could, you can reverse it, but I don't really like doing that. And, and the other thing is, uh, you could comment on your really dry canola. Canola can be dry, and if it's hot, it can still spoil. There's been a lot of people who have been burnt with that. So it's really important, even, even if it's dry, get that temperature down from 40 degrees or 30 degrees back down to at least below room temperature that first day. Even if it's dry, then you're safe, okay? Now, if you want to play around with this adding water, you know, taking out the garden hose and putting it back in, that's up to you. But uh, I guess I'm more concerned about having safe grain than, than worrying about getting your market share of, of the water. Thanks, okay, thank Ron. You. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.